Welcome. The following video or audio are the study of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse of the King James 1611 Bible. Our family welcomes you to our household Bible ministry time. You may watch and listen with us. Our goal has been from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Each chapter by chapter we try. And topical preaching and teaching aids you can find by searching different topics. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. Come and appreciate the word of God for our spiritual growth, our development in the word of God by these lessons. Please feel, feel, please feel welcome to upload and share our Bible study with family and friends. Like us, subscribe, write a comment, let us know you heard the message. The video or audio are not copyrighted and should be used and not abused. Thank you. First Timothy chapter four. Now, when Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, he didn't, you know, write it out and go chapter one, chapter two. I mean, chapter markers are not in the originals, uh, but they're a great help because it'd be without the chapters and verses, it'd be open your Bible to page five sixty two. About four lines down on the left side of the page, starting with the word, the, you know. They're a great help. I believe they're inspired by God. What I'm trying to say is when we get to chapter 4, we're still talking about chapter 3. Chapter 3 was about the bishop and about the deacons of the church, about the mystery of godliness, how God was manifested in the flesh. Continuing, now the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly. That in the latter times, later on, some shall depart from the faith. Now the entire book of Timothy is about Timothy here. Stay in Ephesus. There's trouble. I want you to preach to him. I want you to teach him. I want you to get rid of uh, this, this false doctrine. Make sure nothing else creeps in. Make sure no deceivers are, are, are taken over. I want you to bring the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to pray for the rulers. Uh... You sought to be a bishop. That's a great office. You've got great aspects of the ministry, Timothy. Things are looking good. Oh, isn't it great? But it's not always going to be joyful in the ministry. There will be people who are going to depart from the faith. In the ministry you got, there will be people in that church. You've got people you invested time in, people who you love, people who will... Be a part of your church members will be one day, one day, they'll be there one day, and then they'll be gone and never to return. And Demas is such a person in 2 Timothy 4. He followed Paul, and then one day, I'm gone. Depart from the faith. So they're saved. Giving heed to seducing spirits. So there are other spirits out there, and they are working on Christians. Don't think just because I'm a born-again, Bible-believing Christian, I read the Bible, I do right, I won't be suckered into a cult. You'll be suckered into a cult just as a newborn babe in Christ will be suckered into cults. Seducing spirits, they're out there to seduce you. Don't help it with magic, Christian magic. There's enough seducing out there to lead you off and stray from God. And doctrine of devils. So we read in 2 Corinthians 11 that Satan has his minister. Paul says, be aware of another Jesus. Be aware of another spirit. Here it is. Be aware of, an, of another gospel. Along with that, with ministers of Satan, there are doctrine. Doctrine means teaching. There is a teaching out there of devils. What is that? What is that teaching? That is religion. That is man-made thing. You find religion and education are the foundations of devils, which man believes. A doctrine of of uh, education would be a diploma. What they teach in colleges, uh, evolution has turned people away from God. 
Religion has turned people away from God. That's the devil. Notice it says devils, plural. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. Now, hypocrisy is you say one thing and you do another and you're lying in your hypocrisy. You are a two-faced believer and in that you're lying. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And that's where, that's where they, like somebody who's had their foot or their limb removed by surgery. Then they will burn the edge of that limb. But there are people who do that with their conscience. They kill the conscience and then they burn or harden the conscience where it will not bother them anymore to serve God. The conscience is the greatest gift that God has given man, saved or lost. That conscience, if you keep it alive and keep it well, God can use it for you not to sin. And if you do sin, God can use it for you to come to repentance. Now, if you come to the life that is saved or lost, that you don't care what you do, you have no concern of your actions, you're just going to do it because you're going to do it, who cares about the consequences? If you can stand before a judge who is going to rule your life into prison or death, and you don't care, you seared your conscience. If you got to the point where you will not listen to that preacher, have nothing to do with what he said, you're going to do it your way, and, and you know what? You don't care what the Lord does or anything God does. Your conscience has been seared. All right, forbidding to marry. Now, we talked about this the other night, last night. There are people out there who say it is wrong to marry. There's a religion called Catholics. They tell all their clergy and they tell their women, you know, you're married to Christ, but don't get married to a to a to another person outside your sex. They forbid Mary, and according to the scriptures, let's read the scriptures. Depart from the faith. Come on, come on. I'm, I'm a Catholic. You may say I'm a Catholic. Let's read the Bible. Depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry. That fits in the entire qualification of what we just read. If there's somebody out there who says you're forbidden to marry in the realm of doctrine of devils, it's evil, it's wicked, it's not right. Where we read in chapter 3, if you want to be a bishop or be a deacon, you're to be married. Plain and simple. And commanded to abstain from meats. Seventh-day Adventists. You can't eat pork. That's under the law. Excuse me? What did 1 Timothy 4, 3 said? They're religious that teach, you know, vegetarian. No meats at all. There's one to say, you can only have fish on Friday. During 40 days, you can't eat this. You can't eat that. That violates the scripture. Now, if a doctor tells you, say, listen, for 24 hours, I don't want you to eat for this test. Or you cannot eat this food anymore because it is destructing your body. It is not healthy for your body. That's not what this here. Now, there are some people who cannot handle pork. And their doctor tells them, hey, listen, you can't handle pork. All right, that's your own necessary. That's your own body. Your body cannot take it. That's not here. This is not what we're talking about. Some people can't have nuts. They are allergic to it. So that's not what we're talking about. But here is when a group of body of people has come to the conclusion for other people that, hey, you cannot do this. They're trying to put you back under the law. Chapter 1. We're, at, we're at Ephesus, like Galatians. There are people trying to creep in. They're trying to put the law back. And it's funny because even the Old Testament law, you didn't see anywhere where anybody was forbidden to marry permanently. Now, they were forbidden to marry outside their tribe. But this is complete forbidding. 
and abstain from meats, which God has created to be receiving with thanksgiving of them which believe. That's me. I am a believer. I believe God in his word. And know the truth. I know the truth. I know Jesus Christ saves. I know the gospel. I know the mystery of God in it. That means it's telling me I can I can have pork. God created the pig for my glory. If I could think if I could have a, 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 a plate of bacon and say, Lord God, I thank you for this bacon. I, I know you said to the Israelites, hey, you can't have it, but Lord God, thank you that my wife can have lobster. In the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you for this. And God says, you're welcome. You're welcome. A religious say, no, you're going to do time and whatever for, for guilty and for condensation for God to have that plate. And God says, well, who said that? Israel was to be a particular people. And again, as I said, if I'm going to sit down and witness to a Jewish person or a seven-day Adventist, I would not order in a restaurant something that violated what they believe. Now, that is done voluntarily. I could sit down with a Jewish person and say, I want to witness to him. I am not going to order a pork sandwich or anything like that. Now, if he got up and left and is not coming back to my table, waitress, kind of BMT, BLT. Okay? He's not there. I'm not offending him in, in the gospel of Christ. That's proper. And what we're looking at chapter 4 it, with these things is a group of people have decided you can't do this without any asking of God. And you get yourself in trouble as Joshua with the Gideonites came and pretending to be somebody. And Joshua never asked the counsel of God. These people just came up with rules and regulations. Why? You ever ask yourself, listen, like I said, I grew up as a Roman Catholic. And I'm not picking up. I'm just showing you where the Bible shows they're wrong. What is wrong with with men marrying wives and the, and the women marrying husbands? What's wrong with that? Why would you base your doctrine? Why would somebody else say you can't eat this when your body can handle it? You're missing out. If you never had a lobster or a crab and, and your religion says you can't, you're missing out. We're under grace. You can thank God. For every creature of God is good. Every creature. Does it say minus the pork, the, the crab, the you know the the shellfish and anything else God says you can't eat? No, it says every creature. So go back into Leviticus and Deuteronomy where it gives us this list of creatures that Israel could not eat, and you can say, I can eat because that's aren't those all creatures? There are, there are people in this world, the heathen, what, what would the heathen do? That some of those food, some of those animals in that list, they eat. And they can trust Jesus Christ as their Savior and continue to eat that stuff and still be saved. And they'll be the ones in heaven with a big smile on their face over those who could not eat the stuff and enjoy it. And nothing to be refused. How do you like that? Peter told God three times, I ain't eating that, I ain't unclean. God rebuked him. You get down and follow those men, and you end up in a house where they where they eat all that stuff. And then you find Peter sitting down with the Gentiles, having a meal with them until the other Jews show up. Why would Peter gotten up? First of all, he's with the Gentiles, and he's probably now eating Gentile food. And bowing his head, oh God, thank you for that, that vision. Thank you, I can have this stuff. And that vision that Peter saw in the book of Acts, there was all manner of four-footed beasts that came down. Those were illegal. Nothing to be refused. Now, again, if your stomach... Your body cannot handle it because the way your dietary is built in your stomach or you have an allergic allergy to it, don't eat it. You can't eat it. But that's because of your own physical thing. It's not a body over you saying, oh, you can't have this. 
It is wrong for the school system to say nobody can have peanuts because Jimmy has a nut allergy. Uh, Jimmy, I'm sorry you can't eat nuts. I will keep my nuts away from Jimmy. But to stop the entire school from having nuts and peanut butter because of Jimmy, that is a violation of the scripture. Now you be careful around Jimmy. But that does not stop you from enjoying a peanut butter jelly sandwich if you love it. Why should I have to eat kale because Jimmy has an as I hate kale. You see what I'm saying? You see how this this is sunk in with with peanut and everything. It's all around us today. There's certain even Christians will come up. Well, you can't have that in your diet. Yes, I can. The Bible says I can, if I can bow my head and say, Lord God, thank you. There's only one food that we find in the book of Acts that teaches on this side of the law. I am not to eat blood. Or things strangled. That means food that has blood in it. If it doesn't have any blood in it, what are you going to do? What are you going to do in 2017 when you go to the meat department? Do you think they remove all the blood out of that meat? Do you think they do it way the Jewish and God's custom for no blood? No. You take that thing out of the package, you throw it down the plate. What do you see in that plate? Blood. So you got to remove some of that blood, but that's not even all gone. And you can, listen, you cook it, do it right. You ask God to, to thank it. You, you thank God for it. And you can eat it. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. It, for it, if it be received with thanksgiving. If it be received with thanksgiving. It's amazing. You ask my wife. We go out to eat every once in a while. And as a family, we will bow our head and thank God for it. It's some, usually somebody always comes, wow, we, I want to thank you guys for doing it in public. We're all supposed to do it in public. Amen. If you don't thank God at home or in public over your meal, what did it just say? If it be received with thanksgiving, then you know what? If you don't thank God for it, you don't have no business eating it. And if you don't thank God for, for it, at the, at the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment, you'll be held accountable for, for eating and not thanking God. So what are you going to do in America in 2017, the Lord Terry, that your entire Thanksgiving meal, that one day we give to God for thanking, and your main attitude is you want to go watch that pigskin, and she wants to go shopping at midnight. And I've sat in one of those days. Oh, sorry, just say the blessing. Hurry up and get over it so we can get eating. <laughs> if you don't thank God for it, you're going to be held accountable. So eat all the lobsters you want, but if you don't truly thank God, you know, for it is sanctified by what is sanctified? What is set apart? The food. By the word of God in prayer. How's that? Oh, you can't eat that. The Bible says, I can thank God for it, and the word of God sanctifies that food. That word of God sanctifies that pig roast as much as deer meat that the Bible says that a Jew could have. Set apart. God will honor your diet as a Christian if you thank him for it. Man, if, if you are put on probation by religion or by education, man, you are missing out. But what about sins? It is wrong for a priest to marry a woman. It is wrong for a nun to to marry a man. But it's okay for them to, to play with a little boy sexually. That's wrong. That's wrong. If thou put the brethren, say people, in remembrance of these things. What? The diet. <laughs> 
We're talking about the ministry, chapter 3, the bishop, the deacon. And we're running into these things of deducing spirits and doctrines of devil. Because why? We're still talking about the ministry. There are churches out there that are doing that, Timothy. Paul warned the Corinthians, your meat is dedicated to a God. All right, if, if you are flat down at your table, they flat down a piece of beef and they say, okay, here it is. Eat it. Enjoy it. Thank God for it. Timothy talked, I mean, God talked about this in the Corinthian church. But if you're sitting down, a guy says, that, that meat was given to our God. At that point, God uh, Paul says, don't eat it. The only thing that Paul will tell us not to eat in certain cases if you find out that meal was dedicated to God. So a Christian has no business receiving the mass or the host or the drink from a mass. And that is why some of our Christian brethren died on the stake, died by torture, because they would not receive that mass because that mass proclaims that to be a God, small g. The only uh, thing with, with diet that we have, that we are to abstain from, if it's given to another God. Other than that, if it's, if it's not given to another God, and it's put down before your plate, and Leviticus and Numbers says, hey, you're not to eat that. Oh, God, I thank you for this. Eat it. God says, thank you very much. It's a sanctified meal. If thou put, put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. What's a good minister of Jesus Christ? All right, there is seducing spirits. There are doctrine of devils. There are lies and hypocrisy. There are conscious of being seared. There are people who say you can't marry. And there are people who say they abstain from meat, but you can enjoy the meats. If you tell your congregation that they can thank God for their food, God says, thank you very much. You're a good minister. That's what it says. Nourish. Notice how God and Paul uses that word. Nourish. We've been talking about food. The subject is food. Nourished up in the words of faith. And good doctrine to counter the doctrines of devils. Now look how Paul spoke of the negative and brought to us the good, the positive. There's a doctrine of devils, then there's good doctrine. Don't let that doctrine of devils come. You replace it with the good doctrine. Unto though has attained but refuse profane and old wise fable that we just read about that again chapter one don't give in to lies and with this double warning there had to have been something in in an ephesus they may have f featured themselves on these old wise fables aesop fables would be another one it's wrong there was never a girl named Goldilocks that visited, I don't think bears build houses. Last time I checked, pigs don't build houses. And then if you're going to have your child learn about a girl that goes into a house, eats their porridge, breaks their chairs, and sleeps in their bed, first of all, that's breaking an entry. That's stealing. That is destruction of property. And that is... And she don't pay for it at all. You going to teach them right? Get away from those fables. Teach the Bible. There's plenty of stories to teach your children in the Bible. Other minds, other stuff. Other fables would be Santa Claus, Easter Bunny. Those are fables. An old wise fable is if you put your tooth under your, your pillow, the tooth fairy will come. Who told you that? Didn't mother? 
Well, who is mother? She's married to a man. She's a wife. She lied to you. That's a wife's fable. And exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Now, I like how Paul does this chapter. He does one part with another part, another part with one part, like the book of Proverbs. We've seen the, the good doctrine. We see the doctors of the devil. And he goes, listen, exercise thyself with godliness, with godliness, not weights, not an exercise bike, not a gym. How do you know that? For body exercise profiteth little. Now, he didn't say it didn't profit at all. Exercise is good, Timothy, but you're not Mr. Atlas. You're not preparing for a boxing match. You're not an athlete. You're a preacher. Keep your body good health, but don't overdo it. Again, people have overdone this, this weights and body and exercise movement. There are people who are more for their daily job than their daily Bible reading. There are people who will lift their weights more than they'll read the Bible. And we all die, healthy or unhealthy. And with this body exercise profit little, let's go back to what we are talking about with food. you got to eat a healthy diet and all that. You're still going to die. Whether you eat like a horse or a cow or you eat like a barbarian, you're still going to die. But then again, still, body, exercise, profit, look, take care of your body. Now, on the other hand, people like me who don't take care of their body, that's a sin too. Overtaking your body and not taking care of your body, they're sins. So, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Having promise of the life that is now and of that which is to come. So godliness, living a godly life is more important than exercising. Because it will take care of your life now and it will take care of your life later. Oh God, I won the gold, the silver, and the bronze medal. And when the elders cast their crowns at Jesus, you have nothing to cast down with the people. What do you do then? You're not going to carry that, that gold, silver, or bronze. That ain't going to get you in glory. That's not going to get you the, the toss at Jesus Christ. Oh, God, my lap thing on my, on my, my wrist says I did 46 miles this week. Really? What's that going to get you in the eternity? That may get you a little, a little healthier today, but what's that going to get you in eternity? Now, godliness, yeah, you take care of your body, but don't do it to the stream. You go in all the world and you preach the gospel. You teach other Christians. You help them to grow. You live a life with trying to live it without sin. When you do sin, you confess your sins. You rebuilt, You rebuke those that are doing wrong. You be an example to others. That's a godly life that will carry today and will carry off into eternity. How much you lift. By the way, iron. You know, you lift iron. Iron in the Bible is not a good thing to read about. Read, read, find, get a concordance and find the word iron and everywhere in your Bible and read about it. It's not a good thing. Should you use something else for weights? Me, I like to see plastic weights. Be perfectly well. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. It's flavor, it's favorable. What we just read, chapter three and chapter four, is favorable. It's faithful. Use it, preach it, guide it. Warn about it. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach. For what? 
what we just read. The Word of God. Our diet. I mean, if somebody finds out that, you know, you're not... And again, there's Christians that bother me because, oh, you're supposed to eat, the, you're not supposed to do this, you're supposed to do that. Man, put it away. Just put it away. Because God says I can eat what I eat as long as I thank God. The word of God is being preached, chapter 2. Jesus Christ is the mediator. You'll suffer reproach for that. If you challenge a religion that says, you know, why do you not have your people get married? You're going to suffer reproach. There'll be some that say, well, you know what? I don't exercise as much as you do, but I do what God, the Bible tells. Oh, you ought to lift this. You ought to have these vitamins. You're going to have more calcium. You're going to have more uh, protein. No, I just need to have a little more Jesus. Oh, Jesus, then. Come join my gym. No, no, no. I won't. Because we trust the living God. Ooh. Verses 1 to 10. Everything I do in opposition to what they do is because I love God. The seducing spirits, the doctors, the devils, they don't love God. They don't trust God. And James says that even the devils tremble, but you can tremble at God and still not trust God. There's a big difference. Somebody that does this, this weightlifting and take care of their body for what they can eat, what they can't, it's really not for God. Some of them really fear death. And they think that they take care of themselves as much as a religion take care of themselves. They're going to get a longer life. Their self-worship. Because they fear death. And you still can, I see people, they just walk out in the middle of the road in front of cars. And you know what? You get run over by a car just as much as a person having a BLT walk out in front of a car and die the same way. That's self-worship. It's not God-worship. You know, from, from Genesis 2, do you realize that there's a big thing in the Bible about eating? The first commandment ever to man was don't eat that fruit. What was the second commandment to man? Thou shalt multiply and reproduce. God has dealt with a man with food and sex. And women wonder why, well, you know, all he wants to do is eat, all he wants to do is have sex. Those are the two commandments that God gave the man to do. And both of them in chapter 4, sex, you can't get married, and you can't eat this, has to deal with sex and food. And God says, go ahead, get married, enjoy sex, enjoy the marriage bed. Hebrews chapter 13, or 12 or 13, I forget which one. Go ahead, eat all the food that you want as your body can handle it. If you can thank me for both of them, if you and your wife can pray before me and, and give me the credit and trust in the living God, go for it and enjoy your life in God. And if you live godliness, you'll enjoy your life in eternity. Who is the Savior of all men? Now, what is that? Does that mean everyone is saved? No, it doesn't. But the Bible told me, go in all the world and preach the gospel. The Bible tells me God is long suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. And the Bible tells me, take the gospel to the lost men. God wants them saved. So when Paul says, who is the Savior of all men, who is trusting living God, he's saying, we suffer reproach because we take that gospel to them. And what is that gospel? Trusting the living God, the Savior. Who cares about 
the marriage. Who cares about the eating? They're dying and going to hell. And anybody who, who's involved in any public ministry knows they suffer reproach for the word of God. Who is a savior of men, especially of those that believe. So there's those that believe and there's that don't believe. These things command and teach. What? What we just read. You are to teach about sex and diet in that pulpit. And what God has to say about it. You are to talk about your health in the pulpit. What God says about it. Paragraph. Let no man despise thy youth. He's a young man. Now we're getting back to the character of Timothy. You know, Timothy's a young man. But unlike young men, sorry, unlike young men, he had a godly mother and a godly grandma that brought him up in the scriptures. Timothy had a head start. He's not a novice. I remember Eunice, I forget what the other one they brought up young Timothy in the scriptures. So mama, grandma, if you bring up your children in the scriptures, you give them a head start. But be thou an example of the believers. All right. In what? In word, your mouth. And also the word of God. In conversation, your life. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean talking on that. In conversation, your life, your character. Be an example. In charity, your love. In spirit, who you are and inside of your your life, because your spirit, the air, God breathed into man, he became a living spirit. Your breathing ought to not be. Put with how put with tobacco or marijuana or pollution. In faith, what you believe, you're to be an example. In purity, your life to everyone. You're a young man, but let your let the word, let the conversation, let the charity, let the spirit, let the faith, and let the purity do the speaking, not your age. Your mom and your grandma brought you up, and I took you under my hand. You are my spiritual son. Paul speaking. Till I come. Remember Paul said, verse 15, he wants to meet with him. And give attendance to reading. All right. Here's a church layout. In the old church, old New England, the church service would be, they got up, somebody would read a chapter out of the Bible or a couple chapters they would get up and say all right today everyone open your Bibles to first Timothy chapter 4 and somebody would read that who was eloquent in speaking probably or maybe to let somebody in the church read to exhortation the preacher would get up and he would expound chapter whatever verse whatever chapter that man just read so the preacher would get with somebody in church and say, Sir, I'm going to preach about today Matthew 7. I want you all week, next Sunday, Matthew 7. I want you all this week, I want you to study and I want you to get Matthew 7 because you're going to read it Sunday morning. And that man would get up in prayer and read Matthew, whatever the, preach, the preacher said. Then, then he would sit down and then the preacher would get up and expound what was read in the church. To doctrine. That's teaching. And you find this in Nehemiah 8.8. 8. And that's what the church services were like. The word of God Explain the Word of God and teaching the Word of God. There it is. Nehemiah 8 8. That's what you're to do, Timothy. That's what the old churches did. 
Get up and read. Get up and sort what you read. And then teach it. If your church is not doing that, then it's wrong. I don't see anything in it about singing. Neglect not. As a matter of fact, one time I remember right in the scriptures where Jesus sang. Neglect not the gift that's in thee. What's the gift? His ministry. His of the word of God. The laying of hands we're going to see here in a minute. Timothy has been given by God the gift to be able to preach and teach and read the word of God. That's what we just read, verse 13. The gift that's in thee, which was given thee by prophecy. Oh, look at that. Someone told Timothy, you're going to be a preacher, and you're going to be a man who's going to do the word of God and preach the word of God. With the laying on of the hands of the presbytery, that's the body of elders. Timothy was ordained, and with that ordaining, you go and preach that word. And they're in season, out of season. Meditate upon these things. The word of God. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. The reading, exhortation, and the doctrine. That thy profiting may appear to all. You read, study the word, exhort the word, and the teaching that others may look at you and learn and know. By your character, you stand out in the word, the conversation, the charity, the spirit, the faith, and the purity. You walk the talk and talk the walk, Timothy. For those that are in the church, and those that are out of church. Chapter 3. Take heed unto thyself. Timothy. And unto the doctrine. See, Do you need to know what we're talking about? Paul has dressed it again. Verily, verily, Jesus used to say. Continue in them. The word, the conversation, the charity, the spirit, the faith, the purity. Reading, exhortation, the doctrine, what the gift God has given you, continue in death. For in doing this, thou hast both saved thyself. That's not salvation. You have laid an outline for what? What did you save yourself from? Ready? Look at verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh especially that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil. Timothy, how do you get yourself out of that? You get yourself in the word, in the conversation, in the charity, in the spirit, in the faith, in the purity, reading, exhortation, the doctrine, and trust in the living God. You do that, and the word of God, that will keep you from, from following up verse 1. You don't do it, you're going to fall. Somebody's going to get you as a minister of the gospel, and they're going to follow you up if you don't stay in that word. They're going to mess you up. Continuing then, for in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself, all right, the preacher, and them that hear thee, the congregation. Your conduct, your study, your love of God, you in the word, you studying, everything that you do for the trusting of the, of the Spirit and your faith in God, not only for your life, verse 1, but for those that hear you, your congregation, verse 1. You don't want your people to fail. You don't want them to, to seduce by spirits and all that. You don't want them to give heed to the doctrines of devils. You better live your life correctly. You better be that example to them. 
If you get up and lie, what do you think they're going to do? If you get up and be worldly, what do you think they're going to do? If you're going to be carnal, what do you think they're going to do? If you're not going to witness, what do you think they're not going to do? If you're going to have booze, what do you think they're going to drink? If you're going to have good times and fellowships and all that, what do you think they're going to do? If you're going to read and study your Bible, what do you think they're going to do? They can only do as much as the person leading them. So we are to be proper examples to all. And that's just not the preacher. As a member of a Bible-believing Baptist church, you are also to be an example to the preacher and to the, and to the congregation. You're not to be a, a bad example where somebody can use you as an excuse. How do you help your preacher? You live like your preacher, holiness and godliness, and be also an example to the flock. Because you'll be backing up how he lives. And those that don't, they'll get two people that will go against their living. 